And thank you for attending and interest in the program. Thanks to the last
I'd be pretty uncomfortable doing that without engaging. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've brought it up and explored and explored, and nothing's been done. You know, in the absence of any sort of master plan for that old pool area, I'd be reluctant to kind of get people to do it solely without a space there. When we've already engaged them to a point where they, they understand we're going to be going to Doon Street, that seems to be palatable, they seem happy with that, I would be reluctant to. Unless the push is coming from them, we'll be reluctant to change that direction at this point. And through the Chair, it's only been recently that Council's provided the direction to uh, master plan for one of a better word, that, that area. Um, if Council likes, and we would certainly prioritise that body of work to bring it forward, if that helps unlock the answers to the future of art and cultural activities in Blackwater. Bear in mind to do that work properly, it's going to take a bit of time and be guided by the committee. Okay. Is it interesting pursuing the whole pool or to proceed with 11 Dean Street? I think we just stick with 11 Dean Street for the time being for that group. It's my opinion. Yeah, the arts group is happy with that and it may end up being a temporary space for them anyway. There's an imminent need for them to move, and that's about it. Okay. The master planning won't happen right. No. And, and we were led to believe that it was uh, fairly, fairly urgent, reasonably urgent, that they moved from the old premises to somewhere else. So I'd be reluctant to change the course of that conversation now. <coughs> The Arts and Cultural Officer, um, Karen, would you, any comments? Or Luke, or Luke, or Luke well, sorry. Yeah. I know that the um, Local Arts Society did investigate the Dean Street location and I'm not happy to move into them. Yeah, the building they're currently in with that building is just long by second. Well, that's that. Okay, thanks, and Karen. I've also had this conversation with the Michael Lee Water Group down there. They're happy to stay in their current location as long as the facility is left there. That will be the conversation. Okay. Through the chair, uh, Luke Schultz on the back. Is there anything you want to add to those comments? Through yeah, the chair, the, the uh, uh, Six Evans Street property where the, the uh, group is currently assigned <coughs> is the property affected by the body. Um, Dern Street doesn't currently have any damage to it that, that I'm aware of. Um, we've been going through a process with the state government to acquire um, 11 Dern Street. Uh, 11 Dern Street, originally, they, um, there was a, a significant lay of number of months for them to respond and lay down because it may have figures you didn't buy that property. So we put a budget of $150,000 in this financial year. Um, which would be to totally different position of the 140 defences. So that would then enable us to use the Street for that or that it is um, not close minded to other alternatives for the full slot, which is basically been leading on from that other than the Sorry through the chair, it just seems Difficult for me to accept why we um, spend 150 and then turn around and ask them to go into the precinct. They're going to inject some of their own funds and time into the development of Dean Street, and then we're going to maybe turn around and ask them to move into an arts precinct, a potential arts precinct, and, and then there's going to be a reluctance for them to, to move, and then we're going to be looking for other people to go and do it at the Dean Street. Uh, into um, the pool area. I just, I just think that the question needs to be asked of the community or whether that's really where they go or is there potential for them to go down into that pool house? Yeah, through the chair, I, I, I can see the corollary uh, of, of issues, but the, the challenge is the master planning needs to occur to determine first that that's definitely what will occur on site. Um, and that I don't think we can uh, do that process justice in under six months. So there's a bit of time that we, it needs to be taken to develop the master plans to consult and go to the community and then ultimately endorse those plans. And I imagine that 
some some of um, uh, bringing those plans to fruition will involve seeking funding as well. Uh, accommodating that work might be easy and it could be done in six months' time. But if that's the desire of the committee, then uh, direct me to make the master planning for this site a priority and we will push a few other issues off the table to make it a priority and bring it back to you with some answers. But I think the challenge is um, the site that the art group at the moment is no good. They need, they need a stopgap measure. They need to go somewhere. Uh, 11 Dead Street uh, will provide that um, solution. We'll also provide some other solutions in the future if they're not there long term. But give the direction and we will implement. That's no problem at all. Mr. Steele, that has been a decision of council to go ahead with that, the Doon Street acquisition. So, you know, this is a decision on the ground. It, it is, but I'm respecting the, um, I'm respecting through the chair, the observers asking questions, suggesting that we're not on the right course of action. And I'm challenging the committee to say, that if you don't believe that we're doing the right thing, let us know we can change. I think we've got a, got a direction from the committee already that we're happy with 11 Dern Street. Right. Would you like a motion towards no, that? No, I don't need it. Unless you're going to contradict what's already stated, or we'll change what's already stated, but let's leave it as it is. It's the outstanding action, just an update on implementation of that decision. Okay. Any further uh, meeting actions? Further meeting actions. Okay. Uh, material personal interests, conflicts of interest, personal gifts, and benefits. None. Okay. <coughs> Committee recommendations, notes. So we have treasurer community consultation notes. Um, all these community uh, consultation minutes, we Put them all together as one mm -hmm. to accept them. Mm -hmm. So we have Treasurer Community Consultation Minutes, Spring Spring Creek <coughs> Community Consultation Minutes, Orion Community Consultation Minutes, Acadia Valley Community Consultation Minutes, and also Rolleston Top Rain Consultation Minutes. Those are we unhappy to accept those? Do we need a motion? Yeah, yeah. Okay, move. Councillor Hayes, seconder, Councillor Goodwin Smith. All those in favour? Pass your hands. Just for the check, I just had a comment there um, that I certainly like to commend uh, our area manager and the Springshaw area, um, Alison and Pyle, for putting that together. I think that was um, uh, in, a, in the spirit of uh, moving the engagement around to different locations you know, in that area uh, and meeting people there. The, the feedback was very, very positive and, and uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, uh, I suppose flexibility is, is really appreciated. And the more uh, opportunities we get out to different, you know, different road structures, different feeder roads in the in the in the region, the better. So I would certainly like to commend the area manager and I to bring that together. We, we certainly ask our area managers in all our community consultations to make them interesting, to take them where people have an area of interest, and I think that was pretty successful. So I'd just like to commend them for that. <laughs> Just within those minutes, um, there's actions by whom, quite often the action is by Mayor uh, Kerry Hayes. Can we um, have those addressed by the person that's the officer that's responsible? So. Yeah, good pick up, Mr Chairman. Uh, we will substitute the relevant uh, manager or officer in place of the elected member mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we've got to the character of implementing all those actions. Yeah, some of the names are in the wrong columns, I think. Oh, look, through the chair, well, then it's just advised that it's sort of, they've already been updated, so that's good. So the, the copy you've got in your, in your yeah. current version of the agenda um, is not the latest version. Because Mayor Hayes is going to be pretty busy. Yeah, I'm getting very concerned. Thank you very much. Well picked up, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that very much. Yeah, and just a, just a comment, too. I noticed some. Um, I'll use Top Rain as an example because there's only a very small number of people actually from the Top Rain group that was at that meeting. And I have concern about particularly the, um, uh, just find it, um, 
the 20 mile intersection, which is number 12 on page 45. Um, I'd hate to think that we go ahead and put beans there because that is not the wishes of the general community based on a, on a you know, conversation with a couple of people. <laughs> As we know, you go ahead and put beans somewhere, well, then you really do have a problem with rubbish. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a bit concerned. That was the only one that I guess that, that jumped out at me. Um, I hate to think we can put beans there based on recommendation by, in this case, Hayden Jones, because that's not the wishes of the community we need to have a dumping site just there for 20 miles wide on the highway. I think that's the last thing that we want to do. Just through the chair on the, the first one, um, it's an personal one. It's saying that the councillors will be advocating on behalf of that group when they go to Canberra. Have appointments been made and is everything in order for that to happen? Yeah, yeah we, we are in the process of securing the invitations. It's very difficult um, to access their politics, yes, yes. but we will we'll most probably secure the invitations with ministerial staff. Okay. So, all comments for the committee? Consultations, right? This is a page ID and there's a typo. Where do we? So we're about to on page ID. Uh, on the wheel and then we go on the topic. Uh, there's a, in the action service, please do the section right here. Keep it with the should be wet there. Can we get the spelling? So I can cancel one. The E-R-B-U-R-N. This is going to be a road, I think. I think it's a road. We'll break that. Okay. All right, moving on, the uh, radar for round four meeting. Um, we go through Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. Can't through you, Mr. Chair. Um, perhaps as you'll recall, previously we used to send this up as a report, but now uh, from the chat act meetings, the evidence just comes up as notes for you and us. You'll note that in the uh, section four, that for round four um, applications are gigs and gigs application for $15,000, uh, Gemfest for $3,000, Fruits and All, uh, 1183 animating spaces, $2,500, the other animating spaces, $2,500, Capella, uh, Bakehouse, $1,000, Roaming Artist Retreat, $8,000, CHRC Arts and Culture Book, $5,000, Local marketing development, 2,000. Artist training workshops, 3,258, total of 43,000. Um, so we're just asking you to endorse those meetings from the, uh, those meetings from the check out. Thank you. Okay, so are we going to uh, have a mover for the to endorse those, please? Mm -hmm. Move, Councillor Quiddle and Smith. Second, mm -hmm. Councillor Nixon. All those in favour? Very generous. If I can just make a comment in relation to one of the general business items, and I wasn't present at this meeting, and that is in relation to the Curran, the Queensland Rural Regional and Remote Women's Network. I'm pretty sure that's meant to read. Um, and their art competition, Councillor Daniels and I uh, were approached by Roman Reed yesterday, and recently as yesterday, um, in regards to gaining support from council in uh, relation to uh, hosting or supporting an art competition. Um, so that's something I think, uh, and even sponsoring. So I'm pretty sure Bob will have um, some correspondence to council within the next 24 or 48 hours in relation to what they might be looking for from council and if there is an opportunity for council to support. But I think it would be a great opportunity to promote art and culture and craft within the region and a great opportunity for our council to um, be seen to be supporting this event. So I guess we can pursue that conversation once we have a bit more information, but just wait and that might be an opportunity. So, moving on to communities. Um, Mosquito management plan, I'm guessing. So I'll go through Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just invite Kirsten who also might be doing this as well. Um, so this is a report uh, to update uh, our mosquito management plan. So we'll uh, 
to be endorsed by you today and extend out to 2020. So the plan was uh, superseded, the superseded plan of the original, which was prepared in 2009. And there's quite a number of best practice updates um, that have been included in the outcomes. Something that's probably fairly important for our region given the current climate. So I'll hand it over to Kirsten to detail some of those for you. Through the Chair, thank you for the opportunity to present the Mosquito Management Plan 2017-2020 for you today. Um, the plan, as Daniel discussed, incorporates the latest science and advice and innovation from Queensland Health to ensure that Central Highlands Regional Council re um, remains current with industry best practice to deliver um, prevention education and mosquito population control as efficiently as, po uh, sufficiently as possible. As outlined in the report, the latest proposed plan is an update from the last plan in 2009. Um, Council is now armed with better knowledge about our techniques to manage mosquitoes, such as biological control, monitoring, and public education. We want to educate the community better <clears throat> in terms of mosquito management to take a more holistic approach to managing health risks of mosquito-borne diseases. So new technology that's been released means that we can shift from setting mosquito traps to check for numbers that may trigger in blanket fogging um, of affected townships to more advanced trapping methods, which captures mosquito species of interest. So the important thing to note there is um, we do recognize that there are issues with um, blanket fogging and we want to move to a more um, educated sort of way of addressing community concerns. So within the mosquito management plan, there are three key objectives, which were identified as essential components. Um, early identification, so surveillance, prevention, and mosquito control, um, the use of mosquito traps. And um, number two is education, so public awareness and education through house to house visits. And then research and partnership, so research, communication, and collaboration with Queensland Public Health Unit. So it is important to note that the development of the mosquito management plan was developed in consultation with internal and external stakeholders to ensure a collaborative approach. Um, further, the implementation phase of the plan, if adopted by Council, will ensure that stakeholder engagement with the public occurs at a transparent and communicative level. So we want to ensure that the community are educated and we plan to engage with the communications team once we get approval from Council. Um, and it is important to note that the environmental services team are proactive about mosquito management and the plan is to be reviewed annually to ensure that we're still prescribing the best practice in mosquito management. Okay. So any questions? Yeah, just <clears throat> excuse me, through the chair, um, again, the Ross River and Barna are all notifiable diseases. Have we had any reporting in the last 12 months, for instance? Yes, yeah, they, they uh, state government through the chair issue a communicable uh, notice every month, I think it is, and there's usually a list of, of how many patients have been diagnosed with those diseases. Uh, and I know that there has been a number, I can't give you stats, but that's actually, uh, that'd be interesting. We could report on those stats and provide that information if councillors are interested. Through the chair, I might uh, ask Perry up the back, and he's got a wealth of knowledge in the front of his mind, I'm sure he'll be able to add to that comment. Yeah, sure. Um, through the chair, uh, the average is about three month region, for our regions and trials, which is the past period. So, Joe, I just don't, does, does this a plan say we're not going to do spray or you know, misting, fogging, talk? Is that what the plan says? Uh, through the chair, the plan stipulates um, objectives of how we're going to manage mosquitoes within the area. So we're not eliminating the use of blanket fogging. Um, it is almost like a last resort method. So we want to educate people better. So if the plan was to be adopted and approved by council, we would like it to be rolled out in, term, in line with the mosquito season. So in you know, September, October this year, and also when it starts getting warmer. So the breeding of these. And how how do you see the plan implement, being implemented in regards to baiting? Do we still use egg bait, other things, in regards to water, um, food and larvae? Yeah, um, through the chair, I might have to direct to Perry. I need to hear that again through the chair, sorry. I oh, just, do we still do egg baiting and larvae? We're trying to extinguish or minimise larvae and water holes. On oh. I'll give you a bit of a backstory to the spines. We've reviewed it 
Um, we would, we're the people with you know, people that get the response or complaints about mosquitoes, um, mosquito numbers, mosquito bite, mosquito abuses. And time and time again, we would respond to these complaints, of course. And time and time again, we found out that it's um, essentially self inflicted. So the mosquitoes of interest are the ones that hang around and breed uh, in um, pots and pans or are uh, around humans. So it's Jibani, it's an alpha pictus, the main species of interest. And so it's that those households that we're targeting, uh, is those households like the ones to complain to us as well. So we're targeting is a bit of hard work, but approaching and um, and educating them so we can reduce the incidence of cross river and uh, prevent uh, any uh, further diseases like Zika, as I mentioned, and so then maybe the region is reaching out. So, so what are we got? We still, do we still do baking then? <coughs> Yeah, through the chair, the, um, with the new technology is that there's uh, it's called BG traps, and they actually target when you target they use to tie uh, or other pictures, nothing else. And before we were trapping for numbers, like trapping using light and carbon dioxide for numbers, but then that only gave us numbers. Then we had to tease them out and find out if there was a digit type. That was Time consuming, etc. So, if uh, through uh, through this discussion, if the if we do get an okay for the mosquito measure plan, we intend to purchase a microscope and do our own identification. So, the response time for any decisions made uh, will be pretty quick. Within the um, just point out to me within the, the plan. Uh, adult, adult sizing, space, uh, space sprays, uh, misting or foggings within that, but also the trapping as well. So any further questions? Just, just previously on, uh, not long ago, we used to use bait in water, so I'm talking about egg baiting now, so the standard misting still there, and it's a last resort. And that's what we do. We do normally trapping, identification, what you're after, and then you might do some spraying for that. In the old days, we just Nullifying <coughs> fog around the place, and everybody with any sort of asthma or any other respiratory, whatever, copped it as much as any of the poor old Aussies. So, um, but all, I'm just thinking is that there's probably, <coughs> there has been, as I said, uh, a push, and certainly was in the early 2000s for us to do some baiting in in of larvae because of the of our proximity to the irrigation scheme, uh, and also because of you know, the number of, I suppose, um, uh, natural basements which are held as well as uh, outside of household control. So that hold, hold small, you know, small ponds um, and are perfect breeding spaces. So I still haven't got an answer, I suppose. Are we saying now we have a, an alternative to the egg baiting and larvae control is now when they hatch and are airborne, we're now going to kill them with a we're going to kill them with it, attract them to a light and stop them out there as well. Um, it's important to, to differentiate uh, the mosquitoes of interest. The ones that uh, uh, at the moment we have across the river um, in, in our region, uh, the, I dare say it's not all mosquitoes, they use to tie is because would, would be infected, it would be a carrier of uh, Ross River, but the statistics show approximately by average three, three months, yes they do. So we're trying to target those specific mosquitoes. We could never um, in our region eliminate the other mosquitoes, the scotch sprays we're familiar with. Uh, it's impossible because we've got riverine systems around town, getting to all those little Locations where um, they breed, Scotch grains breed, would be impossible you know, to put the other side in. So, because we can't get rid of all the all mosquitoes, that's just impossible. We're just targeting the ones that uh, will, uh, 
would aim to protect public health. Ones that are started as two different species. Uh, this is I need to say a bit just to knock them out. And where are we knocking them out? Where they breed in people's, uh, in and around people's homes. That's all, it's the only place that's been identified as to where they breed. And that's where we're targeting by education, by, um, you know, getting them to empty it out while we're there, the whole lot. Give you more detail. I can go into more detail if you like. So I just still got to say, but I see a flaw in the argument of, in the in the in the in the, the, um, the pleasant plan they're putting forward, and the fact that in the peak areas, the peak time of summer, rain periods, large you know large amounts of scotch grass, particularly not these are the non uh, the non health concerning mosquitoes. These are the ones that though they cause a lot of angst in regards to what people can do, um, you know, in regards to you know. Just, going in their backyards, having a barbecue, you know, and, and so these, these are ones that create lifestyle problems um, that we don't, in those er those times when we know it, we know there's going, going to be an acceleration of breeding, the, the rain, it's, it's during the rain season, small squalls, um, lots of water holes, while we aren't attempting to take those mozzies out before they, they become airborne, even though they might not be a health hazard, they certainly are in a hazard or a, 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 a problem in regards to people's social well-being and so, social interaction, whether it's going out into the open. That nobody sits there thinking, it's a scotch brain, this one's not going to hurt me. Um, well, there's been a couple of people have reported to me about Ross River. Um, everybody then becomes fearful of any mosquito. So all, the, all I'm saying is I just think that the, the policy fails our communities in regards to us not managing mosquitoes at those peak periods of those summer times and those summer rains where we man we should be managing them at the larvae stage. Um, doesn't matter who they are, whether they're the little ones, the big ones, the ones that bite, the ones that cause pain, or the ones that cause health issues. All our community sees they can't go to their parks, they can't go in their backyards, they can't go to sporting and open venues, and they don't like it. And I get lots of complaints, like I do this year, last year, and other years from Blackwater and Springshore and every other community where people gather about these little birds. So I just think that if we've got a policy that's not going to deal with those people in peak times, I don't think we should be doing it every month of the year, but certainly it's during that December, January, February, we know when it rains. The policy is not covering every, every aspect of what we should be doing as a community, and um, and I think, to me, I don't like to see us doing the bulk spray. I think it's a, it's probably the last, any any activity of last resort, but it seems to be the only policy we've got of, last, of resort now to give people that that opportunity to enjoy their community, you know, and that is to spray. We should be, as I said, having active identification of areas that we could control mozzies. Before they, before they hatch. Doesn't matter what variety they are, and I'm not particularly worried, as I said, whether they just don't need a health variety. It's my lecture for the day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The points you bring up, Councillor Bell, are incredibly important, and as well, the, the plan itself doesn't necessarily exclude any of those options, and it's primarily looking at a prevention focus so that we don't get to that box frame um, component. But, Perry, is there anything specifically you want to add about how you prevent and monitor that during the peak seasons? Yes, yes. Through the chair, the, the definitely not eliminating uh, fog. Uh, definitely not. The last signing, uh, of, just on the fogging, research uh, has it that uh, very few communities are fogging anymore. Now, if we go to the last signing, uh, getting into our vast region, our vast waterways, our say, let's talk about animal for a moment. Getting to all of those locations where the scotch grays, largely scotch grays, would require many more resources than we call for here in this um, yeah, uh, A lot more resources, a lot more. Resources. And the, by way of example, um, in the most, the most effective community would be the, uh, the township of Ralston. Um, in Boston, I've, uh, I've, we've set up 
with these two uh, nurses of public health, uh, nurses, very wild ladies, uh, who, who have children of their own, of their own. And Rolston gets um, a freaking double dose of uh, not only mosquitoes, but swamp mosquitoes, but also the midges because of their location very closely to the type of river system that goes through the town. So they're, they're a red flag to me. They would, uh, they would call us and say, hey, it's getting really bad. Can you do something about it now? The last season, Rolston was the first town to be in fault uh, because there's only one way to deal with Meiji's fault. Um, so Meiji's and mosquitoes got wiped out. And Springshaw was the only other town this last season. The other townships, um, um, as I said previously, we would get complaints, we would follow through, only to find out that uh, the mosquitoes were, um, they were self infected. The gutters were, the people's gutters were either blocked. Or there's one case in Bluff where we had a lost count of above 100 um, pot plants where the Rodilians could give it a plant. A hundred, oh, sorry, I lost count past 100 uh, pots of Rodilians. Very lovely to follow every pot of those plants and uh, have some potential breeding uh, site for these leaves to be planted. So we had to uh, walk, we walked, yes, to us. We walked around the one acre of rotten, I think it was, rather large. And not only those pots were issued, there were speed troughs, animals. There were other bits and pieces, and they were all capable of holding more than they were, all capable of breeding mosquitoes as well. So, again, self infected. <coughs> other new examples. So, it's a species of interest again that we need to take this, because that's going to get them, that's going to make them sick. The others, there's a bit this. I acknowledge the social issues, uh, they are abuses, um, but it is Queensland. Through you, Mr. Chair, if there's an opportunity for us to adjust any part of the operational side of this plan, happy to take it away and reevaluate that and bring it back before the committee. Yeah, through the Chair, I think um, uh, Council Bell's calling for a more assertive approach to prevention. Um, and coupled with that, and it is referenced in section 3.7, uh, we probably need to make sure that we are doing enough in that public awareness and education space. So what is the mood of the committee? Would you like us to make some amendments? Are you happy to adopt in principle subject to those amendments? Or are you happy to like to take it away, make the adjustments and bring back to the committee? What's the direction? Just through the chair, just one comment. Terry did say that Harry said we have on any complaints that go forward. Um, and there are complaints come, I know I'm on the health committee in Springshaw, and that's where they usually come through. Um, but I know that there are mosquitoes there at odd times, not just in those summer months. Um, so, look, I think that probably we have a Bohemia bulletin there. I think it would be good that it covers Ralston and Springshaw, and if you've got complaints coming from there, it would be great to put some publicity in there about, you know, ways of prevention, because that's really why I asked about those um, diseases in the first place because I had heard there were some in those areas. So I just, you know, think that there's an opportunity there to take it forward, but I still back up what Councillor Bell says, because you take a baby out and gets bitten by a Scotch Grey or some harmless one, it still brings up a big lump and an itchy lump for that baby for a fair bit of time. So I just think that it is a social problem as well as a, a disease porn problem. Um, so we need to have a, a wide variety of, of things to eradicate them. So moving forward, are we happy to endorse it or would you like it brought back before us? Well, but just personally, I think the policy needs to have a, some, something in there that deliberately looks at where we're going to actively actively look at um, yeah, well, minimising yeah, minimising the, the um, the, the ability for the larvae to, to hatch. And I mean, I just think that the, the, the whole life cycle of the mozzie is, is something we're talking about here. That's about, yeah, people fix up their backyard so they don't free, and, you know, we try and get rid of and eradicate as many of the water holes or places where they might. That's, that's good. It's community education, great stuff. Um, but then there's this, we seem to have a policy now that's a missing part, 
between that and when they take wing. Mm. And I just think that what we should be doing is saying that our policy should be embracing whatever is modern and new. And I know what Brisbane City and others do with helicopters and baiting and they do, you know, and the, the millions that they pump into those types of activities. Um, you know, and I, we can say that there's a lot of water holes around here, but gee, a lot of those coastal areas have a lot of water holes too. And people are really trying to attempt to get to this, you know, as I said, a full spectrum of a control or, you know, at least management of the mozzie. So I'm just thinking that we, should, we really need a policy that covers that area. And I just think we're at the moment, we're, it's a bit of a vacuum there. And I, although I'm happy with the rest of it, it's just that part to me about that larval stage where, and, and we're not adequately saying we're going to manage it, watch what other people are doing, try, trying to control the um, mozzie before they get to the wing where we can. Um, and where it's, it, it certainly is a, is a, has a, a no environment, great environmental impact. But as Council Nix is saying, you know, I mean, I think, you know, a single bite of any mosquito on a young infant um, at any particular event can be infected, causes just as much, can cause as much pain and infection, you know, infection to, you know, a young person as what some other stuff might do. So. I just think that these are little pests that we can control and, and, and should have that stage as part of our management plan. I just think we're missing it. That's all. So I'm happy with the management plan. Other than that, I just think it's, as I said, it's inadequate in saying that it will we'll look at and continue to deal with um, what is at the larval stage. And, and just to wrap up, and you asked the question, should we um, pass this as is? I think subject to those changes, I think that um, Daniel can do that without Adam coming back. I think you've got the message loud and clear. Um, it's a great document and there's been a lot of work put into it, so I just think that you've got the message of what needs to be added. So I just think that um, we could leave it to Daniel to make sure that those, <coughs> those eradication or control things are measures put in there. So I'd say that I'm prepared to accept it um, with those minor adjustments. <coughs> Can we can now remove that please? Move Councillor Goodwin Smith. Seconder. Mm -hmm. Councillor Nixon. All those in favour? Passion unanimous. So what we've done there, Mr Chairman, just for uh, Melinda's benefit, is we've adopted the mosquito management plan subject to uh, an amendment to include resourcing and operational approach to minimising the ability for labour and that's something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So that that will the impact on Section three of the plan, and for completeness, uh, once those amendments have been made, we'll see for that copy of, of the plan. So you've got a copy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, moving on to uh, unpacking the innovation and debrief. So, Ms. Smith, back to you, Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, uh, Council, you recall. Our last meeting in Blackwood, I provided a brief update on the Unpacking Innovation Conference that myself, Deputy Mayor Governor Smith, and Councillor Daniels attended. Uh, so, this is just to formalise that, that um, briefing here. Um, there's a, a short, I, I won't go through the details of, of particularly what we spent the two days doing, except for the particular areas around um, the workshops, which were included in the two days. They were based around open data, digital disruption, and contemporary business model for innovation. Uh, innovation by design, people, place, and policy. Um, a lot of that information is having quite a large impact on some of the work we're doing in communities as well, in, in particular around our livability study, uh, strategy, sorry. Uh, challenges to innovation, um, innovation for inclusion and empowerment, creating a digital ecosystem, bringing the innovation partnership to life, uh, and regulatory framework around not only innovation but local government and how that's impacting other levels of government as well. Um, the key learnings from the, the two days, um, I've pieced down the two in particular there and um, both Councillor Daniels and Councillor Goldman Smith um, have assisted in contributing to this and um, the first one was to just begin in whatever that innovation journey the local government might seek. Um, a part of the message was that whatever your original plan is and no matter where you start soon after that you'll find yourself on a different trajectory and most councils and not only councils but most other organisations have done that and in actual fact have been more successful than they originally planned just by beginning. Um, and the second part to it, which was probably a big theme throughout the two days, was 
the, the most successful innovation projects and cities, I didn't quite label regions well enough, I think, um, have demonstrated advanced levels of genuine cooperation and collaboration between all levels of government, industry and the community. So um, some of the, the lighthouse cities that were on show was the city of Barcelona, um, and the city of Cincinnati. Um, so both of the, the two key speakers were from there. The third one was the city of Kitchener um, in Canada. We actually did a, a Skype interview with the two of the people there for, with the whole conference and it was, it was facilitated quite well, although um, the councillors and I tried to send a message through Twitter to get the, uh, a question through Twitter, but it didn't seem to get there and they couldn't answer at the time, but nonetheless. Um, and in this report, I've actually asked, um, it is a decision report, and I've asked for the committee support um, for three things, um, the, the ongoing investigation of available options to establish a community smart hub, um, the commencement of discussions between the relevant stakeholders to contribute to the project, and then a future report be presented back to this committee um, outlining any progress against this. Um, and you'll see at the bottom of the report, I've indicated a, a particular proposal around how something like this might be framed up in the Central Highlands. Um, part of the first part there talks um, about the, the traditional three R's, the roads, rates and rubbish for um, local government. Um, as you go further down, the, the, proposal, the proposal of giving it a, a tentative name of Central Fusion, but that's fine, it's happy to be adjusted accordingly. Um, but in, importantly, the, um, the fostering of what we've added to the three R's is another two. So roads, rates, rubbish, recreation and reinvention. So that would be, uh, that could be part of how um, the Central Fuge Smart Hub will operate in terms of um, we could invite people in um, to Central Highlands here within our community, uh, importantly, and from, from outside of our community as subject matter experts to participate in some um, small events where they could assist in solving some, some problems for the local government. So, um, I'm asking that the council that the committee can continue supporting this uh, and a lot of the what, where, how, who and why is sort of undetermined at this stage, but that will be fleshed out and unpacked in, in some of these ongoing discussions with stakeholders such as the HDC and other um, state government departments. So happy to take any questions and Councillor Goldman Smith or Councillor Damage, if you want to add anything to that, please feel free. Yeah. Through the chair, um, I was just going to ask the CHDC were represented at the Innovate conference because they're already looking at innovation and moving forward and we have incentives for new businesses and, and things but yeah I just wondered I, I think that they were probably progressive um, and I just yeah so and I think Megan you're on that board aren't you? Yes I am and look they um, the, some of the officers were had an opportunity to attend but you know, it was the clashes and they that was when the Prime Minister was in town. That's right. Shadow Cabinet, so Liana was scheduled to come. Yeah, down. unfortunately. They were a bit skinny on the ground with people, but we yeah. never could come. But so yeah, so. In collaboration, we can do a lot. So, yeah, and through the chair, I think this is probably a real uh, beginning to that collaboration between CHRC and DCM, the bigger innovation picture mm -hmm. of what's happening in the region. So, this does certainly connect us with them. And certainly, CHDC are uh, working very actively in the space that they're building and uh, bridging our region's new economy through their collaborative action plan. So, I think what Daniel's talking about here gets very nice, like mm -hmm. a glove with this project is doing. So. Um, but I think, yeah, it's a, a nice wrap up and, a, and I guess a big thanks to Daniel um, with his connections at Logan City Council because without that we wouldn't have had that opportunity to participate. i have certainly open my eyes to what other councils are doing and also to the opportunities that our council has actually to work collaboratively with other councils because that will be where the opportunities will emerge um, around funding perhaps and other, other more collaborative approaches to innovation and smart solutions. So we have a recommendation there. Um, that's uh, that can be started. An ongoing investigation of available options to establish a community uh, smart hub. Um, how do you want to progress with this? Move that way or go back through CHDC or? Yeah, I think CHDC are probably in this space. Maybe we can reword something there that supporting the idea or something, I don't know. Well, as we've gone through the chair, uh, you, we've been collaborating very closely. Uh, and 
through Daniel's team, Luke certainly needs to be getting a lot of the work with Leon and Nisi, so to say. Yeah. I don't think we're uh, overlapping, if anything. I think that we're going to come together uh, even more on, on what, where we need to be as a community uh, in this space and as an organisation. So I certainly support the recommendation of the committee uh, and the I would add to that, not, not, a, not an amendment, but I'd just add to that, that it's important for us to continue to work closely together, noting that Leon has resigned from Church DC and uh, making sure that we establish another contact there uh, to make sure that we're working together. Sorry, mm -hmm. Mr Chair, as well, it's probably remiss of me to mention that uh, Sandra did also play a part in, in crafting this up as well. So a lot of that work is certainly interfaced with what CHDC is. Yes, and through the Chair, what I was kind of getting at was putting that in that recommendation. Um, happy, just, happy to include it. If, if the words just aren't there to say collaboratively with CHDC. Sure. So if you're happy, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious we could add to the yeah. ongoing investigation um, with CHDC yeah. um, of the available options. So we're um, happy with that. Yes. Any collaboration? Yeah, that's good. Okay, now I have a mover then, please. Move Councillor Goodwin Smith, second to Councillor Daniels. All those in favour? Carried in Okay, actually, just a PS to that. It's very interesting what the Canberra Regional Council is doing with their um, smart, smart, yeah. smart hub, and uh, there was some great media attached to the launch of their hub the other day, and they did some great interviews with uh, some of the potential startups and uh, mentors to the startups. They're using their business in Rockhampton, they're getting them engaged. That's very exciting. Um, I don't have the social media site in front of me, but they have actually got a site dedicated to what's actually happening in the engagement space. So. Sure. Mm -hmm. so, moving on, the family riding park for motorcycle, motorbikes. Uh, yeah, thank you through the chair. Uh, in the absence of Mark, um, I will talk through this one. This is just an information report. Um, we were Conscious we could have included this in our operational report, but I understand there's been some work over a number of years here and it was a real opportunity to provide a bit more of a detailed um, update. So there has been some ongoing issues with um, mostly dirt bikes and, and motorised bikes um, in multiple areas around the region. Um, so the, the police are seeking an approved uh, area where bikes can be ridden. This, unfortunately, there hasn't been a specific area identified. We, we talk more in the bottom of the report there are about a couple of areas that have been investigated, none of which have come um, to fruition at this stage. Uh, representatives of council, including um, Mark in his role as, as manager of Parks and Rec and also um, our CEO, I've met with local police and active community members on a number of occasions and they continued this, uh, this discussion. So um, unfortunately we haven't, we haven't progressed it to it probably a place where <laughs> generally the council will be happy with in terms of the identification for the particular area that suits the police's requirements and, and our requirements as council. Um, I'd also like to note that this is genuinely a complicated issue across all, all local governments. In 2011, the state government prepared a report um, highlighting the problematic nature of, of this particular um, issues across local governments and I'm aware through some of my previous dealings with other local governments that um, a number of the areas that have been set up on the wire on one in particular <coughs> um, towards Boat as it has, has had unfortunately poor performance in terms of reducing the number of offenders on those bikes and actually an uptake in people attending that area. So we are we are fighting an uphill battle here and um, it is something that's particularly on our radar and we are focusing on finding an ideal location but there just hasn't been one that's presented itself today. I don't know if Scott, you want to add anything more to that with your discussions? Well, oh, through the chair, it's I outlined in the report, I'm sure that um, the committee members have read the report, but there is a focus on the old um, Midworth site, the old Pecky and Sally Oakboard site, uh, which is about 13 kilometres to the west of Emble. It has rail frontage there for it to have some economic potential in the future, and uh, there's been some discussions that uh, short term use of that site. Um, say nine years, three by three, at least for nine years might provide an opportunity to solve a problem. 
and then council still has the benefit of um, retaining the land for some other higher purpose uh, if the need arises. Uh, and negotiations to date have been around uh, motorcycle in Queensland as uh, the regulator in this space being heavily involved and council not being actively involved. Uh, there would be a need to, to be some sort of uh, local committee that oversees um, the management of the site. Uh, there'd be someone there on staff to make sure that the, the, when the facility is open to sweep the track to make sure that there's been no accidents and things like that. Uh, where it's at, it's, it's the, the couple of years of discussions uh, has been good in a way that it's brought a lot of clarity to what's required and it's, something's not far off happening. So I would say to Council that um, I think very soon you'll, you'll be asked or requested to give consideration to making that site available for a short term use. And uh, it'd be interesting to see what happens there because if it is supported, then what, that might open the door for Council to look at some other unit solutions in communities like um, I know Capella comes to mind. It's certainly got a problem there that, that the police are concerned about and other communities as well. But I think if we can work on the big uh, centre, which is Emerald, and provide a solution, that's a start, and then look at other communities and get for better solutions. So it, it's at a point where it won't be long before something comes back to the committee for consideration. This is just an update to let you know where things were at. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks, Chair, just a couple of questions. Like, you haven't negotiated with the bike club that uses Mosquito Creek. Yeah, that's, that was a heavy focus through the chair in the early part of the discussions because originally um, the Emerald Junior Motorcycle Motocross Club had a, an enduro track uh, that was designed, it's a technical track designed by Yamaha, five kilometre loop, uh, but difficult terrain to negotiate. <laughs> That didn't fit the need for what's required here. So that was more for a skilled rider. And the Emerald Junior Motocross Club are not interested in reopening that track because their focus is on motocross, which is a very different discipline to trail riding. Uh, so that meant that that wasn't an option. What was an option uh, was for council to perhaps be involved in uh, negotiations to seek a lease extension for the Emerald Junior Motocross Club so that they could get a bigger footprint of land and then that would make available an area of land for trail riding. However, uh, the challenge there is that they wouldn't like to have the site accessible at, at um, uh, regular times, so two or three times a week. They only want it accessible on a monthly basis or whenever they're having meets, and that represents a problem too. Um, the site that we need needs to accommodate uh, all sorts of people in the community, people that work shifts and mine rosters, uh, that might want to access a facility midweek um, so they can take their children or, or, or go to trail riding with their family. So we need the flexibility of having a model that might see the track open three or four times a week um, so people can use it. So that didn't go anywhere, those discussions, and it got back to the need to have a, uh, have a, fresh, uh, a fresh site. And after negotiations fell over with the Agricultural College, um, then the focus was back on to let's, let's find that site. The council made a decision that it, it wasn't looking at the um, a site west of Emerald as a midworks uh, location any, any longer, so that meant we'll have the possibility there to freeze that up uh, for consideration. Just um, on that site, uh, um, insurance would be pretty heavy, wouldn't it? Riders would actually have to be a member of Motorcycle in Queensland. They've got to be registered. It costs around about $100 uh, per year just for a basic membership to be able to ride uh, at a facility. And they regulate that facility. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, and look, there's a big list of things there that you would need. Well, I wouldn't like to see too much put on that site because, like, um, regardless of whether the meatworks go there or otherwise, I mean, we've kind of set that aside as an industrial precinct, really. I mean, looking at the meatworks, looking at where the sailors go in the future and maybe other business arrangements could be made there and going back to the innovations previously we spoke about. I mean, it's, you know, I just wouldn't like to see too much put there and if you've got camping area and barbecues and all that, I mean, you just about have to man it 24 7 or, or you know have a caretaker there which i think is you know, it's probably getting out of the range of just motorbike having a day out 
you know, I'm even concerned and um, through the chair again, and, and not, not creating the decision council may make, but if that side is not suitable, then uh, I'm optimistic that we'd be supportive until we can find another a location or advocating for another location that may be not in our control might be a state government pass or land. But uh, I think that the merits of what we're trying to do uh, here in collaborating with the Queensland Police Service to address a problem is, is important. Um, where it ends up, of course, it's not, it's not the critical issue. I'm not against using our site, I'm just against using permanent structures on that. Well, the report, if you have a look at the report, you yeah. notice there that it mentions the mountable structures and in, in, any, any uh, entity that was going to take something on for um, nine years uh, wouldn't want to do anything too permanent in nature, no. I'm sure. Well, do we have a problem? Uh, through the chair, we do have a problem. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, people want to ride motorbikes um, in locations where they shouldn't or where there's, a, there's mixed uses, people walking dogs or jogging, and there's a risk factor there. Uh, the Queensland Police don't want to, um, yeah, I, I suppose, they want, they want to solve the problem. They want to police the problem. But they're also aware that if there's well, not an option, no, 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 not at all. Uh, our council's got a very good cooperative working relationship with the police, and, and they've actually came to us and spoke to us about their, their concerns, in that they can they can put the full weight of the law against offenders. Uh, however, they know that there's not an alternative. There's not a reasonably accessible alternative. So they're not going to solve the problem simply by issuing tickets and printing notices. And penalties, and, and they have come to the council uh, as a community leader and asked, "Are we in a position where we could help solve the problems?" Our response was, "We want to be involved, certainly," and, and that became uh, a mission then to try and identify uh, a suitable solve. <coughs> we went down, through, uh, down a few dry gullies, and we've now got to a point over those couple of years of, of looking at alternatives, working with the state government. Uh, try to uh, find something in reasonable proximity to uh, Emerald. We've been able to identify how it was run, how it needs to operate, how it can be managed, and that's probably the most important part of it. Finding the site is also important, but that, that's obviously the logical next step. It's important for the police to make sure that it's far enough away from town that it's a disincentive to risk running the gauntlet and riding to the site. So they don't want it very close to town. It has to, it has to be a situation where you load the motorbike onto a trailer and, and take it out. So and again, I'll just just that's my, that's my question. That's exactly my question. Those that are underage that can't load it into a ute and drive it out, we're not eradicating what is now already the problem, really. No. So it's the it's the age group that wish to go motorbike riding freely. That is the concern to the police. It's not the little one that's learning um, with his dad and mum. It's not those ones that are the concern. It's the ones that are, that are out there riding uh, at will wherever they want to go. Um, those, those people, are they going to conform to going out to these places and pay a fee and a membership on a three days a week time slot? Are we going by doing all this? Is that going to eradicate that problem? Well, and you're going to turn around and say, "Well, no. If we put this in, the police can get them." Well, I will say that because that's that's the honest answer. Through the chair, the police have indicated. So, that are we, my if question is, are we solving the community well, problem? I'm probably that's the question. Right? You're not letting me speak. But through the chair, the police are saying that if there is a viable alternative, then they will apply the full weight of the law to people that break the law. So they have two motorbikes already, and they're able to pursue people that break the law. They are cognizant of the fact that there are dads down there trying to teach their little tactics how to ride a Pee 50, and they're not causing any problem. But they cannot turn a blind eye to that, because that is still breaking the law if they're riding in a place where it's prohibited, aka the Nagawa River. So they're saying to us, if we can solve this and help solve this problem, partner with them to solve this problem, by finding a, a site where this can happen, then there's no excuse for people to break the law. So that's the, that's the sort of, I suppose, part we've been on. It is, um, it is quite normal and common for 
councils to work closely with the police services on, on, on community problems, and this is no different. Um, it's early days in some respects, while it's taken a couple of years to get to, to where we're at, we're at a point where we want to come back soon with a proposal, a community-led proposal, not driven by the organisation, and then the council, our through this committee, can consider it. You can say yes or no. If the answer is no to the site we've identified in this report, well then the, the question will be, is there an opportunity to help support through advocacy, a state government site, or is there some other way? But it might even be that there's an economic uh, uh, development potential here too, because there's many, many places in Queensland where successful businesses are operated uh, that provide these services as well. So you know, it could be uh, an incentive role that we can play to have a privateer of a solution. But this is a community problem. We're community leaders and we're, we're working on it. And as I said, this is an update report, just a status update. And that was a request by the committee. So we don't need to solve it today. It's just about letting you know where we're at. Just through the chair, um, following on, there, there was a problem um, with the rifle range reserve um, and the police were out there constantly getting people out of there. Uh, they were doing a lot of damage and leaving a lot of rubbish. They also were along the river, uh, creating problems there with erosion and also just moving on that street. You know, there was a fence put up along the river to stop that. And just to back up that this site out there, well, it may stop some people that are out of town, but if you go out there and have a look on the opposite side of the road, they're already out there. On the road reserve on the right hand side, opposite our block, there's tracks everywhere and they're going on private property out there and creating a problem. So it is a problem and we've also had that incident in Thierry where they were riding on an area where they shouldn't be um, and there was an accident. So, I mean, I think it is something that is important to all of our communities because everyone wants to get on a bike and try it out. Uh, but, yeah, just to kind of cover off on your question, Councillor Mackey, sorry. Yeah. Thank, you. Is I was it? Say thank you, Scott and Daniel. I'm interested about hearing more in the next report because I do agree that it's something that we can work collaboratively with the other agencies mm -hmm. to look at. Sorry, Mr. Chair, is there an organisation, community organisation that you're working with that, that wants to be the main holder of the, the land? Or is it something you're looking at council control? No, through the Chair, uh, negotiations are made with um, Central Bike Central Service, uh, I think that's yeah, the Yamaha dealer in town, uh, Ross Drake. And um, Ross Drake obviously has an interest in, in this because he sells motorbikes and parts. Uh, but the reality is he's been able to garner the support from uh, quite a few of his customers who identified themselves as being willing to be part, part of the, the solution, part of a working team, part of a volunteer group, office bearers in, a, in an organisation that's yet to be created to run. So there's a strong interest there. Um, Motorcycle in Queensland, uh, which I've spoken about already, they're the regulator and um, they need to be heavily involved in, in whatever the solution is as well. So the, they're the entities the we've been working with. Motorcycle in Queensland, a private uh, retailer, businessman in town in the Queensland Police Service for that early days was the state government, but they weren't able to provide any obvious solutions. I believe they received the report. Yeah, it's just there for nothing, so that's easy. Okay. So, noted, so they don't need a second review? No, it's just into the box here before we leave. Okay, can see. So, everyone happy? Yeah. Good okay. job. Yeah, good job. Moving on, uh, Regional Test Management Subcommittee. Okay, so we'll go through Daniel. Through you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, Councillors, this is an information report uh, to update you on some. Of largely historical um, issues around uh, the pest management subcommittee. But um, in 2012, the LJQ held a conference 
um, where they had a desire to move away from the existing land protection fund that used to be spread across Queensland. Uh, as a result of that, um, the LGA Kiwi partnership with uh, the Department of Agricultural and Fisheries uh, finalised a new um, Invasive Plants and Animals Come Investment, or IPAC model. Uh, that was in 2014, and then in 2016, that was presented to CQ Rock. Um, however, nothing transpired um, during that year. Um, we move on to now, and recently um, we've had some um, progression on that, and we've had some staff members at <coughs> the Regional Pest Management Subcommittee meeting, which was held in uh, Rockhampton, and I'll, I'll pass over to Kirsten to outline the details of how that is going and the, uh, the next stages of how that's going to impact CHRC. Um, sure, so thank you, if you're the chair. So. On the 6th of February, Council received correspondence from the LGAQ inviting us to be part of the Regional Pest Management Subcommittee. So um, just to give a bit of history, there is no um, compulsion for any Council to be involved and it's not expected that Council has to pay any fees to be part of this Regional Pest Management Subcommittee. Um, so during um, the committee meetings, Council has an opportunity to uh, nominate an elected representative um, to represent this um, statewide oversight group um, alongside one of our senior rangers. Um, so just as an update from the statewide oversight group meeting, which was held on the 23rd of May in Brisbane, and there were three items discussed during that meeting. So number one was the land protection model um, the calculation model. Um, number two was the co-investment draft expression of interest review and number three was the direct and indirect benefit definition, so the wild dog and rabbit fence issue. So during the meeting it was decided that um, the discussion point number three about the wild dog and rabbit fence um, had to be scrapped as there was no members from the board present um, during the meeting. Um, so moving forward, um, the next scheduled meeting is in Rockhampton on the 19th of July. So as I discussed, Council can nominate an elected representative to attend alongside one of our senior rangers. So the point of this little overview um, is also to invite anyone, if anyone wants to be part of the process, to nominate and we can give you a briefing to keep you abreast of what's changed since the last meeting. And until the meeting that's to be held in July. Mm -hmm. Through the chair, I would have liked to have gone, but I can't on that day. So okay. I'm, I'm interested in being involved in that committee. Yeah. So you want to go to the meeting? Can I just make a comment, please? Yes. Um, just if you go into that sort of meeting in um, pest management. Can you please raise um, the issue of weed distribution through the stock routes, please? So it's become quite an issue. Um, there's implementation um, all through, um, coming up all through the stock route from Memorial through to Ralston and it's, it's, um, it's actually on where the travel cattle out of travel, so it's it's not it's not a truck. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, and the last thing we really need is the loss of quickly acacia added to all, all of our other pest, our other weeds that are not managed. Thank you. The quickly acacia was the top one that we were supposed to be looking at for eradication for the last three four years. Through you, Mr. Chair, as well, councillors, in our next um, standing committee, we'll be having a report on the stock routes and, and a bit of an update there, which will include some of the pests. So we'll have a bit more information for you then on our, on our current situation where we're at now and how we're going to progress with this. Does that include TMR roads? Uh, or just our stock route Make challenges? Our stock route stock routes. Because I've raised that before about uh, the issues of some of these, especially Crickly Acacia, and it's it, because it's on a TMR road, I've had discussions with our state member about it as well. Uh, nobody does any about it. And uh, there's plenty of prickly acacia that I can take and show you. It's really fun. There's two effects in one. <coughs> See if I can get into it, please. Two. Two. Sir, the pest in my neighbourhood, but I'll see if I can get in, declared. <laughs> He's amplifier anyway. <laughs> Loud music of a funny Saturday morning, two o'clock. 
Keep sure. Yeah, so we can follow you. Some of those particular locations now, ranges, regardless if it's a TMO road, they still have the remit to to use our spraying to control that stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I need to refresh my knowledge to the chair, but I think that some of that uh, government stock levy is to go towards best bank management. So we need to make sure yes, um, we're applying yeah. for all those grants as well. Uh, have, a, have a look at the yeah, act on, the, on, on stock routes right now. Mm. Mm. Things might be changing. But it's only any good if we're actually going out doing something about it. Sure. While we're sitting on our hands, they're seeding and there's more growing. So, you know, we didn't have any prickly acacia and parkland zonia 15 years ago. And now it's just popping up everywhere. And there's ones that you drive past on the main road that have grown and seeded probably five or six times. And you know, the worst part is some of them have had pink tapes tied to them where they've been identified by an organisation and the pink tape is either still there or it's blown off. It's been there for that long. So we're not following up whether it's a stock route or a main road, we're not following up with that kind of work. Alright, good point. Okay. okay, well you have a couple of nominated oh Megan was nominated, so so Moving on to uh, arts, people, play, pop, touch. Yeah, oh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, it would be nice if that's the mood of the committee to endorse Council Manual. My apologies. My apologies. So let's bring you back. Okay, uh, Councillor Daniels nominated by Councillor Nixon. Seconded. We've made a second one, we don't need a second one. Yeah, I'll have a We're just going to endorse Councillor Daniels. Of course, endorse him. He's going to be on the chair, I think. So we've got Merv Nixon seconded Hayes that Councillor Daniels be endorsed as Council's representative on the original testimony. All those in favour? Gary. Okay, thank you. So moving on, parks, people play up play through Daniel. Through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillors, this report um, is an information report to the <coughs> community status of our parks, people play project. Um, you'll note there as well that the last time we had an update was in September 2016, and there's been quite a fair bit of engagement and work that's progressed against that. Um, I'll hand it over to Jane to outline that particular detail and where we're up to at the moment. Um, so, when we moved in September last year, um, I suppose we were uh, seeking feedback on aspirations around um, what the council was wanting to achieve with its parks network. Mm -hmm. So, we did um, some community engagement in that space and got over um, 200 responses, which was really great um, and a really good cross section across the region and across um, age groups as well. So, um, we've taken those uh, feedbacks on uh, items of feedback on board and um, are using them in progressing through um, our, I suppose, categories uh, and embellishment levels. Um, what we, I suppose, done is we've taken a big bulk of time is actually pick up every single park and sporting facility in our region and we've developed a GIS layer which um, we didn't have to start with, which is quite a big step forward. So um, we now have the information we need where we can see every single, um, the, the total land area of parks across the region. We can break that down by whether they're a private facility or council owned, um, which is really important for us for um, sporting provision because there's provisioning rates, but we want to also recognise that some of those private facilities um, do add and support um, those provisioning rates. And there's also <laughs> a need for us to duplicate um, areas where there is private facilities. So, um, that's really exciting. We've um, gone through and categorised um, our parks in all of it for a starting point. So, um, yeah, it's a really exciting layer to have developed moving forward. Um, so, from that, our next step is, um, which we're hoping to bring back to the next um, communities committee meeting, is to um, discuss some provisioning rates um, for what. Uh, how our supply of parks for both sport and recreation is going to be moving forward. Um, our provisioning rates um, currently are uh, quite 
high um, for a, a regional centre, which is great, um, but it puts um, pressure on to, I suppose, our operational costs and capital costs to invest in those facilities to actually deliver them. So we want to, I suppose, put forward something which, I suppose, addresses the community's interest and desire and is um, sustainable for capital to actually deliver on the for the future. Um, and also look at where um, where the shortfalls are currently. So some preliminary work that we've done, we um, are doing it both at a town level and regionally, and that shows, I suppose, some disparities with Emerald as an example. Emerald is a town, if you look at the population. Sorry, the, does everybody know what the provisioning, what I'm referring to in saying provisioning rates? I'll take a step back. Okay, sorry, so it's like a, a per hectare amount per capita. So they're normally um, like, two or three hectares per thousand persons, um, and you figure them out um, based on uh, population today and we're growing to make sure that we're planning um, for our recreation or park network moving forward to address population growth. So, um, for example, we've looked at Emerald, um, the sporting facilities, and um, as a town, it's undersupplied, but when you consider it as a region, we're, we're ha we have a sufficient supply. So, essentially, that's showing that <laughs> our smaller regional areas or regional um, communities have an oversupply of current sporting facilities. So, things like that are, will present and um, try and figure out the best way forward that um, works for everybody. Um, and I suppose most recently our engagement we've done um, has been at the council stall on the show circuit. Um, so we've got, uh, if anybody had the um, chance to see that, we had a big display which showed our park network as a region. Um, and we want to try and um, push that message that our park network works um, is a network across the region and it doesn't necessarily function on a town by town basis. It is all um, integrated to deliver um, region wide. So we got some really good feedback um, from that. Um, uh, some comments that people didn't realise certain towns were part of the Central Highlands. So that's a pretty big education step forward if we can start to break down some of those barriers and um, get the education or I suppose awareness around this is the number of parks we actually have. This is how far our budget stretches to maintain these parks and um, create that awareness would be a big step forward for us to try and suppose, more, move to a bit more of a sustainable model. Yeah. Future. So that's where we're at and that's where we're going. So hopefully the next meeting we'll um, <coughs> have a bit more discussion around provisioning rates and yeah, how everybody wants to proceed forward with those. Good. Sounds good. So questions for Joan? No yeah. questions? Before we move on, if I can just um, acknowledge some of the great work that's done by the team and also by the councils in that recent engagement. It's sometimes very challenging and I don't want to say like pulling teeth sometimes to get that meaningful feedback from the community, but the contribution the councils have made and the great work the team did at some of those events has been particularly important to us getting that meaningful feedback. So thank you for all of that. Thank you. Can I just say that um, this is a too. I sometimes have the planning spectrum of where, well, how many parks you should have, particularly neighbourhood parks. Yeah. Um, their size and shape has changed. So the 80s and 90s, there was always this, I think it was take 10% of money to every developer's lot, you know, or also sort of money in blue. Um, and a lot of that changed. You know, you could sort of take some, you know, contribution size to change. But when we retained a lot of those, we, we had a lot of little subdivisions of little point parks in the middle of the night. Sometimes you wonder whether or not they grew bad. But you know, the whole plan, planning, um, I think the planning experience and, and the knowledge that we've gained over the last 20 years of, of what's happened in communities is probably you know, now, now we're having a good review of them. I think this is very timely. Um, because I think some states, some parts of the top, Emerald particularly, um, some of the development I think we've been having really taken enough. You know, and there's some places where I think it's you know, it's a big long more for it's, it's pretty hard to get that neighbourhood setting as opposed to the more more of a you know sporting regional localised size space and then um, you know and then we can go from there. So it, have we have we tried to draw on the schools? Are, are they are they participating in any of this open space stuff? So the school there yeah. they've all got great facilities, but they've tended to lock us out or depending on. The particular principle at the time, 
but when we get in and out, and I just wonder whether or not we needed to sort of continue that fight. I don't know we've been doing it for years. It's definitely something that um, I think would be worthy to pursue because there's a lot of um, facilities there that I think you can pretty much say are underutilised. Mm. And um, what the, I suppose, particularly for the state schools in the smaller communities, they are um, generally accessible to the public and the facilities are used, used outside of school hours. Um, and I know even at a state level, there's um, the, as a new school that's getting built in an evolving development, um, Calandra South, and it's um, purpose built as a um, community facility, school, and park. So the fact that the state government's moving to that stage, I think the state facilities is definitely an opportunity. Yeah, They've sort of moved their message there. So that's, um, I definitely agree that we would like to pursue that um, moving forward. It's very interesting, Chair, just to add to that, there have been some preliminary discussions in the Gun Kind Advisory Committee about how we will connect some of those schools and the other state infrastructure in the region to better, better be utilised. And Council, you've also noticed on page 102 the process that this um, particular plan has undertaken is quite comprehensive and the expected completion date is, well, turn something back to Council by the end of this calendar year. Mm -hmm. Any further questions, comments? Okay. Uh, moving on to the uh, discussion paper, better mine rehabilitation for Queensland. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillors, this report um, has come at a timely opportunity. The Queensland Treasury released a discussion paper, uh, better mine rehabilitation for Queensland. An opportunity for public comment on this paper closes uh, on Friday. So our planning team are particularly keen to get something together and I know they've already um, mostly completed that but this is our opportunity to um, feed some of that information through to you and get any um, comments that you'd like added into, into our submission. So I'll hand it over to Kirsten now so she can detail that for you. Through the Chair, I'd just like to um, say that um, due date is actually Thursday the 15th of June at 5 p.m. So basically the proposed policy document is the key component of an integrated mined land management framework with an additional inclusion of six proposed delivery elements that need to be addressed in the submission. So there's two components of the um, discussion paper. One is the policy and then the other component is the six. Um, delivery elements. So the six of these include um, number one, which is introducing life of mine plans for site specific mines. Number two is the regular monitoring, assessment, and reporting. Number three is enforceable requirements for progressive rehabilitation. Four is clear completion and sign up requirements. Five is performance based incentives. And the last one is good quality data for policy and regulatory implementation. So just um, in terms of a bit of background, so Central Islands is fortunate to have um, 10 operating mines, two in care and maintenance, and several at various stages of development. Um, so we're well acquainted with the benefits that mines bring during construction and operationally. However, we haven't been in the position to experience the benefits that may be offered post-closure in terms of the re rehabilitation and reuse of these sites. Um, so this discussion paper is really an opportunity for Council to proactively plan for the next phase of mine rehabilitation and post-mining. So um, we're working on that submission. So we welcome any feedback or any comments that um, anyone would like to contribute. Um, just noting that we do have to submit by 5 p.m. on Thursday. Okay, so I'll so. Uh, Councillor Roll first. Councillor Roll. Um, just to, to let you know that I went to um, Professor John Roll from the CQU has um, had he's doing a study into the post mining land use in Central Queensland, and I went to a meeting in Blackwater on the first Thursday, the first of June. Um, it's a all sort of about it was the third meeting of, of the group. Um, I was unable to go to the other ones, but um, the overview, overview of rehabilitation of of, um, of mines, and we um, went through a process of what what would we do on a as a as landholders and whatever um, taking over a um, a rehabilitated mine site, um, <coughs> and it, it raised a lot of issues around water management, um, uh, voids, slope, vegetation, 
um, contamination issues ongoing, you know, 20 years on all sort of things. So, you know, I, I, just, I just wonder about um, why they're doing this sort of rehabilitation um, process and research on it and QTC or whoever it is, government, has bought out a paper on it. So where you know where is the where's the connection between um, because Professor John didn't say anything about anything about um, putting in submissions to to the state government for this one. So I just wonder where you know where it's all at really. And Councillor Rolf, is that separate to the to the CQ Mines Rehabilitation Group that they've been getting together for a number of years? No, the, yeah, this is, is um, this is a... Hello, Morish. I, I can't. Hi, she's the sorry. growing CQ. She's been called that. Yeah, Fleur Morish. So it seems like there's a couple of things that um, have been yeah, separate, to this. separate to this. Um, through the chair, just to clarify, this um, discussion paper, the Better Minds Rehabilitation paper, is um, has come out of that QTC review. So this is um, one of a series of papers that are going to be released for submission. So this paper, just through the chair. So we we can only respond for what we know, can't we? Yeah. I mean, yeah, the other stuff that's happening is probably in civilly, you know, I don't know why or who. Um, but if the university is doing it, I'm sure someone's paying them to do it. So well, you were the, Paul, you told me to go to okay, it. Uh, yeah. I think someone's probably paying them to, to gather that information. <laughs> and again, that's probably to do exactly what we're saying in here is that someday you know, the government's going to change on the white paper or green paper. My understanding is that the government wants us to give them some understanding of what, what, our, what our needs are, what our requirements would be in, in this now moving up the legislative arrangements forward. So I think that's all we know and probably what we need to deal with. Was that, was it? They, they did, they did um, have some limitations or separations between the mining that happens at gym fields and what happens at coal mines. Well, this is only a big thing, isn't it? It's only, only, it's only big mines? Yeah. Any quarries? No. no. Uh, I don't know what you sort of put in there from us, but it's just, yeah, it's just water quality, isn't it, really? Yeah. And it, it rehabilitated to maximum, yeah, best thing. And you've covered that, I don't know what else. Probably not, I don't know. Just um, the concern that I had through the chair was just that are we going to be responsible for any of this? The rehabilitation, is any of the costing going to come back on to us if they don't do it or have we got to supervise that it's done? I'm just a bit wary of... We're not, we're not the regular. No, no, I'm, regular. Just, no. yeah, I'm just wondering why it's come back to us to... Well, I think we're a few stakeholders, so through the chair, um, it would have been oh, probably last year sometime, I think, you know, we met with BMA and we talked about uh, the enclosure plans for crime. And we know that the state centre for processing mining applications is here in Emerald. And obviously the BMA are working closely with the state government because this is new territory where the mining boom back in the 70s and, and now it's about rehab and closure plans. So it's new territory and the offer from uh, from BMA was that they want to work cooperatively with state government to get it right. They want to work cooperatively with local government. And this is a great opportunity for our planning team to be involved in the front foot about the types of things that are important to local government. And I think that um, based on that conversation last year, there needs to be a lot of effort put into uh, what might happen here in our backyard. And some of that can be used as precedent for future mines as they come offline and their rehab and close. I think it's a space we need to get involved in. Uh, and, uh, and see where it goes. So the comment before about what's known, I suppose this is an opportunity for you to, to say something. I know that's not a lot of notice in between the agenda being issued and you coming to the meeting here today, and there's not much time before we have to have a submission in. But if you do have any input, uh, we'll certainly package that up and we'll continue to keep council and the committee informed on where this goes. Councillor Rolfe, I'm just going to 
And it would be interesting to know, like from Professor Rolf's group, and they're looking after the landholders that actually own the, the land underneath. I mean, we'd have to kind of work in with, with that. It's, we're, not going, we're not going to own the land, we're only going to break it. Um, you know, the landholder or the landowner will be the one that we need to look after, won't we? So that it's suitable for reuse. It's more, I think, our role, and I, I'm in territory I'm not comfortable with, but I think our role is we might provide some advice or contribute to some conditions that we'd like to see uh, a, a closure plan uh, include. And, and I think there's an opportunity through this process and through that conversation I mentioned with uh, State Government and DMA for us to be involved. We, we've been invited as a part of that, so we, should, we need to be in that space, even though I don't think it concerns us. Uh, to a great deal because we're not the regulator but it's in our area we've got stewardship responsibilities we're concerned for the environment and the future prosperity of the region we probably want to have some say or put in a couple of conditions through to mr chair just to add to that there's certainly no compulsion for chrc to provide a submission but as scott Robert points out it, it is in our best interest to identify some of those impacts that have historically caused adverse issues for our area and that we can then forward the land that into hopefully what they'll take on this as potentially new legislation moving forward. So. Oh, I agree. It needs to be rehabilitated you know, so that someone can use that later on. And I just wonder, so it doesn't back for us if we've got to eventually supervise it or pay for it or something. Um, through the chair also just to clarify one thing, um, the particular focus is the life appliance plan which is element number one um, that we're providing the most feedback on so that's where we can engage properly with the mines during the rehabilitation stage because the land use designation might change post completion of the mine so we want to make sure that the community are brought on side during the consultation for that life of mine plan so there are some areas in the discussion paper where um, it's been identified that the community aren't really being the focus of those plans. So that's something that we're definitely going to make make a point of in the submission. So there are key areas for each of the elements, um, I guess, focus points where they are asking for discussion points. So a lot of them we can't answer to because we're not a mining company or a stakeholder, but we can do what we can to advocate for council and the community in terms of how, how these elements will be put into that practice. Yeah, yeah, just one final point, but I think the important thing is that in part of the, the old mines don't have the same rehabilitation um, um, regulation as the new mines and I think there's a community perception and this is one of the things that came out too, it's a community perception now is that all mines are going to be rehabilitated to the level that the, the newer mines are being. Um, such as Ralston Coal, whereas you know, they just don't have that information. So um, there's, there's quite a, I suppose there's quite a few issues and really... James, one final thing. I mean, I understand that I don't know what we can do much on site, but hopefully some, I was just wondering whether there's an opportunity to put in a bit of an addendum type um, issue and that is about um, well, as these mines close, we end up with road maintenance and some of them are significant roads. Um, when you look at those around Terry and going back at Bella, and at the moment we have a, you know, agreements with the, the mining companies to pay all or most of it. We've just seen February prime sort of shut, but we've also got an existing mine there at the moment that picks up a bit of that road as well. So, so as matter where we go, there are some assets that we've built. Um, around those mines and in the road closure arrangements. I just think what we should flag is that, you know, the issue of council, like the governments are really be concerned about those things. They are, you know, um, cut and rating because we rate mines pretty heavily. You know, assets that are attached to the mine and mine operation, that, that means getting their people and their goods and services to their mine. Um, and they're going to become the, um, the asset of our organisations. And there's a, a fairly substantial financial hit there, which needs somehow to be incorporated into closure of mines arrangements. So I think looking at that strategic issue, even though we're not just, uh, I don't have a view of whether the void's good or bad, whether it's left you know, full of water or, or empty, or should be filled in. I don't, 
I don't understand that. I think that's what Professor Roth and others are doing. But what I do understand what local government's about and what we're talking about, and that is that we we have got some huge infrastructure exposures that at the moment are a co funded, co supported, um, and uh, yeah, we need to make sure that we're protecting that. And we have also a, a very strong influence on our rate base. Um, we're not seeing numbers, it's a significant amount of money on our rate base that um, attached to mining and mining out companies. So we, when it comes to closures, there, there are those aspects that we, I think we should just flag, even though probably not part of this total discussion, that, that, so that people in George Stitch uh, continue to be aware of that. That's actually, that's actually. In there as well? Yeah, rehabilitation may include retaining built infrastructure such as roads, dams and buildings. <coughs> The exposure is beyond the user agreement. Does the user agreement uh, will provide the conditions for things to be made good, but it's beyond that. Yes. Yeah. For, the, for the new mines. It's beyond the new mines. It's beyond the new mines. You've seen young, young, young farm, uh, farms, well, and particularly mm. you know, the ability for people to be able to do things on farm. Just go through the roof once you've got a pitch in a road, you know, right. and a nice big seal road. And now young Murphy, and Gregory, and those people are now leading the way in some places. That would never have happened if it hadn't been for coal. But those roads are at the moment under a fairly significant road infrastructure agreement that we negotiate each year. You know, if you lose that, someone's going to pick up the key. It's true. It's true. But maybe we should, um, as a further action, Maybe through the chair, invite Melissa Wells. She's the director for uh, the coal business for Queensland based here in Emerald. Uh, she looks up the compliance, the Department of Environment, Heritage Protection. Maybe someone like Melissa could come along and address the committee. Just talk to talk to the committee in future directions so that we've got more of an idea. We can add value through you know, an ongoing dialogue there. I mean, the questions for public feedback, are they the things that specifically you would like us to give you feedback on, do you think? Or is that what we're expected to comment on? Is yes. Questions? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, things like what, under what criteria would it be acceptable for an area of mine land to remain unrehabilitated? Well, in my mind, if, if for us, with the local government had on it, might be we're going to use it for a, for a super dump, yeah. you know, something like that. So, you know, there, there's, there's certainly. Questions we can answer the council on that one. Yeah, yeah. in response to the most of those that are, that we could probably feed into the conversation on behalf of some of the people that we see yeah. represent. Yeah, yeah. 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 And there are some of those that we can't just answer as well, too. I don't know. Any further comments? All right. So we'll move on to uh, discussion paper with better mind, uh, mind communities. Uh, Department up, up Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, Council, you're aware this is our new uh, format for reporting to the Standing Committee, so the Communities Department update has no less than 34 items there for you to um, run through. I'll, I'll consider the report as read, given I'm conscious of the time as well, we do need to push through, but obviously I'm particularly happy to take any questions on any of the uh, particular areas there, whether we are able to address it now or speak with you later on. I'm happy to also note the first couple of points there in terms of emerging trends. Uh, I've just noted in there some general reviews will be um, undertaken for the department in a number of different areas just to align ourselves with the new corporate plan and to ensure that we are um, actually addressing any inefficiencies that may exist. Um, so that's probably the, one of the important ones I want to touch on at the moment. And the renewal of the game plan advisory committee um, is uh, the EOIs are now out for our community members to attend or to submit their nominations for that, and that, will, that is progressing along nicely. And one of the upcoming um, reports that will be delivered here will be the review of the previous um, economic development incentive framework, which was coordinated within um, our communities department. Um, and that, that review and um, a, a report will come 
reviewing that and then looking at some future options how we're going to um, either maintain that or better position that to get some economic advantage in collaboration with the ABSDC also. So while we maintain the local government um, component of that, they certainly contribute a significant amount to, to that particular project. So just a couple of touch on there, but happy to take any questions. Any questions? Uh, there's a question, and it does relate to the um, update that so Jane mentioned um, that provided a current particular parts to play. The game plan advisory group, um, I see uh, Jane mentioned in the update that um, that will also cover the people parts in play as well. And I, I sort of want to highlight that because the terms of reference <coughs> say that and it was never indicated that so, when we were selecting committees so that was going to be the case. So three years to the chair. Um, so the game plan advisory committee won't cover the parks people play, but there are certainly going to be some interface with the work the sporting organisations are going to have to do. Uh, yeah, the, the, the committee and the organisations are going to continue to do over the next couple of years and into the future. Um, there will also be some interface with the livability strategy as well. So there's just some, some real connectors that you amongst a number of those strategies and that committee as well. But the committee itself won't necessarily be looking at or contributing towards the arts people plan. Okay. Everyone happy? Yeah. Good. 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 For me, noting that the uh, calls re resolved, I had a point of call, it was very interesting for me, so it's good to know. So. Yeah, if, if I can through you, Mr Chair, as well, um, extend some acknowledgement to the community services team and uh, let the group as well. Some of those numbers are pretty profound and they show a remarkable service that our community services team, our customer service, I should say, are providing to our, um, to our callers. The, the ability to resolve some of those calls at the first point is often problematic and our, our staff uh, doing incredible jobs. So through the chair, that item 30, I, I know that there's some interest amongst the council and hearing a little bit more about that. Um, in the context of the proposed ID innocent development at Springshaw, I'm not too good. I don't want to put anyone on the spot now, but perhaps um, we can get an update on that in due course. If you'd like through the chair, we can provide a full report to the next committee on how that's progressing. I know there's going to be some connections with the Ivy Anderson work, and I know it looks well, well progressed in some of the churches across the as well. So. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, there is concern through the chair that there is concern over there that um, churches of Christ would overtake the existing groups. I know the churches of Christ have said they wouldn't, and we'll be utilising those committees and, and, and local groups, but we just want clarification on that. I think it's one of the most important issues. Thank you. Okay. No further questions? Okay, general business. Any general business? Chair, one. Um, there's a, what's, the, what's, the, what's the group, the CRG group? So tomorrow meeting, there's a meeting up at the floor or after the master plan. CPAG, yeah. CPAG group. CPAG group. I, I just, um, I'm going to miss the master planning and that group tomorrow. I hope they're going to rocky near the problem of the Institute. But anyway, um, so I didn't know whether you want to have it, still have it, um, or we could defer it. Um, I've talked to Susan about it, and she's quite happy to keep it going if someone else would like to chair it. Um, but I just think, you yeah, from the weekend and other stuff here, yeah, there's probably still some other space. For us to think through, um, it's probably a, it's, it, now's a really good time for us to review our whole engagement strategy, which we're doing. Um, and I think the CRG is in where they fit, and then how, whether or not you need to have that group. I think um, the CEO and others have sort of, and the mayor has sort of said, does it need to have its own group, or should this group be the group? So it's all of those things that we might be able to probably think about um, and bring back to you at the next meeting. but. If you want to have the meeting, yeah, I know. Susan, what's that tomorrow? Tomorrow, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's between, is it between me or the end of the? This is 8.30. 8.30. Just you know what you want to have, but if you don't have it. 10.30. 10.30. 10 10 10 it's after the master plan. Yeah. And between, what's after that? 10.30. Oh, we've got a CHDC meeting. Is that we've got a CHDC meeting? Oh, no, CHDC, yeah. Yeah, they're, 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 Chair, I'll, I'll refer to my, if, if 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather we sort of sit there. Yeah. Can we get another time? I'd, I'd rather be there when we go through to the pop review. Yeah. I, I agree. I think considering mm-hmm. we, we, it's a good time to look at everything. Yeah, a little bit more time to reflect my third, I think. Mm-hmm. I yeah. Do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you yeah. another week? So, just for clarity, for the chair, you're suggesting that CPAG review the future of CPAG, or yeah. are you suggesting that yeah. the communities <laughs> review the future of CPAG? We will come back with some options when it gets I mean, I think there's some fresh thinking about that at the moment. So, maybe if um, you want to sit down and the yeah, yourselves can go and think about it. Because it's been. Comments made, but no one's ever taken it forward to sort of say, well, what's that comment needed to look at particularly? And I think that includes some thinking at the moment about how we actually, even though we're getting this and strengthening some of the CPAC stuff, or the community, sorry, the community advisory group stuff, what are we really doing about the rural region stuff? And, and the mayor and I talked about that over the few dirt roads um, around you know, the, uh, the last trip between Canaan and Springshore and Ryan and everything else. And, and, um, and then how do you link that into this whole community engagement, you know, this whole structure of getting feedback to council and how it works, so just thought we might, now's not a bad time to have a look at all that, now we've got new staff, new faces, and a bit of a new structure. Sounds good. Um, so you, you get yourself a canary and a half back tomorrow. So, yeah, we'll make a note in the, in the general business there. And essentially, a recommendation will come back from the community planning advisory group regarding uh, council's uh, engagement model or engagement strategy. And um, I think that foreshadowing, I think I'd imagine that that would include some sort of recommendation for the abolition of the yeah, yeah, current group. Yeah. Whether or not you need to keep it going, you just use this group. That's what I think. So the CPAC needs to reorganise a meeting day to get together and then that'll come to whichever community standing committee meeting we to Yeah, I'll well cross through schedule Daniel or my note with his team uh, when that meeting can occur when it's its councillors and members of the current CPAC. Just um two other matters um one was the other day we did a, a representation to a few councillors from uh, Linda in regards to the museum. Yeah. I think she chose, you know, I've got another letter from her uh, in that regard. Um, just not too sure how we should deal with that. Do you just want us to, do, do we give to you, Daniel, or how do we deal with it and, and see what we come back with? Um, so Linda Holt um, is, um, has a lot of family historical stuff on her father's plate and would like it. Um, embedded into some bit of infrastructure in the community in Blackwater, which would then become some sort of tourist hot spot. Um, Mr. Mayor, you've talked about talked to her before. Yeah, no, no, I, I had a quick chat to her, and uh, I think the agreement did have a look at the, the collection to sort of just verify the, the veracity of it, I suppose, and the value of it, I suppose, as a bit of an assessment from a tourism perspective. I think she's got a, uh, uh, you know, she'd like to see a, a Blackwater. Regional, you know, museum of some sort. So that's that probably a step further. Yeah. So I know um, that, that's probably fits nicely into um, a couple of parts of your portfolio. Yeah. So just, we need to sort of just progress that we can. Bring a report back to the next community standing committee to have a look at it at the request. It's no problem. You said you had one further matter. Oh, um, it's just in regards to the skate park. We had a little meeting here. Yeah. I just to say how successful it was to be able to get council, uh, get the whole of the young people sitting in a council chamber or this is public, the people's space, I suppose. Um, and, you know, we've got lots of these around the Highlands um, and other little boardrooms like this. But anyway, um, it was very, very helpful. I want to thank um, uh, Daniel uh, for, his, certainly for his input uh, and for being with us and staying with us as late as he did and some of the staff that helped us um, with, you know, with the presentation. But can I just say they're a very, very positive group. Um, very, uh, uh, very focused on um, working around the region, not just here. I see they're linked to they're linked into um, Grace Mill, I think it was, or somewhere else. Someone just following them now on their Facebook site. But um, really wanted to do something around the region with all of the, all of the, the skate parks, and that is a bit about, about um, uh, it's about the way in which young people behave. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit about um, the way in which people. Young people own and are able to 
um, respond to looking after their own environment in that area. And uh, the other thing is about just about the enjoyment of the uh, of, of those facilities for young people too, and make sure the infrastructure so raised that these young group will not incorporate have um, taken up a petition of which I've got a copy here which I'd like to give to the committee um, where they've been sitting at, um, uh, in our facility in some other people's facilities um, taking petitions uh, taking signing signing taking signatures from petitioners or public just general public working through um, people making a comment in regards to um, uh, the skate park it, it's been you know it's a landmark in the town Plenty of youth for all ages um, engaging activity. There were some adults with this group as well, so they do participate and they agree to that. So there's a whole lot of comments that have come through from the community, but I think that's a space that has had a bad name and can get a bad name for activities that sometimes people think are, you know, that are certainly um, illegal or unlawful um, and certainly only antisocial. These, these kids are really getting a positive spring, speed, not just doing it at the, at the facility. But going into our shopping centres and talking to people about it face to face, I'm a young person, I use this facility, what do you think about it? Give us your signature whether you like it or you don't like it. And they raised that six or seven hundred dollars out of a bit of fundraising, selling a few raffle tickets, skateboards, and doing a few things. So great positivity, and we've got lots of these little little types of positivities everywhere in our communities. But um, I just want to make mention of it you just you know forward that uh, we have a petitioner here, there's 163 signatures so far, they got to the petition um, and uh, they got that and I just the table to say that this is not a petition of whinge, this is a petition of saying, um, you know, how happy they are to have a bloody good facility, how happy they are to, to sell it to our community um, and, uh, you know, they're pretty excited that it's prospects if we, if we can get that real volume from us. Those, those kids that are uh, positive in that facility. Mm. So, the table that give that chance to check. Okay. Here we have the form of your check. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair, I might just add a couple more comments. <coughs> um, so, thank you, Council Bell. You only just beat me to uh, informing the committee about this particular group. They've, they've named themselves Barry. Uh, I forget exactly what it is, but it's a particular skateboard tree. <laughs> 180 in the air or something. Yeah, 180 turn in the air. Um, and they're, they're setting quite an interesting pace in terms of their ability to engage and work um, collaboratively within their own little within their own little group there. And I'm um, at that meeting, um, Council Bell and Council Daniels were present, and I made a commitment to that group that we would yeah. do, we would support them um, in the ongoing enhancement of not only the physical but the social environment around the uh, the skate park area here in Emerald. So um, we're working together with them and uh, both Suzanne and Josh will um, will progress that in the next couple of weeks around doing an order of the skate park and uh, looking at potential opportunities to enhance the physical infra infrastructure in the short term and then they're gonna coordinate some events around enhancing the social infrastructure, the social environment more generally. So um, great example of, um, of sort of a community working very closely with the local governments. Okay. No further general business. We'll move on to corporate services with I reckon. Um, or just not to just the item with Jason Bashir. So. Uh, yeah, happy to take the report as read. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's been an ongoing project. We're looking at some immediate fixes about what we can do in relation to the reporting, uh, particularly the workflow and then fixing the feedback loops back to the customers as part of that project. There is a broader linkage to the new corporate software system that I'll talk about. Um, Further on, uh, the council uh, at the next committee working collaboratively across the organisation to manage a community and customer service uh, and information service to resolve as much of the reporting as we can. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one question about the CRM improvements. You're going to have time frames on different problems. Uh, is that in our previous report, Council? No, no, it's going to be. Oh, this one here. Uh, I might throw to Luke if he has any information to pass on the question. Through the chair, we, we, uh, our standard customer service standards that um, respond to the inquiry within two days, it's a detailed one that requires investigation and uh, 10 business days. 
and in terms of it's more problems in Thank you, Mike. Uh, no further business? Maybe plus. Thank you, Thank you.